devices that can literally blow mankind off the face of the earth. Now, bombs on Modern Marvels. Pacific, crewmen aboard the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln keep their edge through a series of constant thrills. During combat, each of these planes will carry tons of deadly explosives. The Lincoln's vast arsenal of bombs is stored below decks, ready to strike when the order comes. So this is our finished product, the GBU-31 Victor II. Of course, we have the bomb body assembly. We have the strikes, which will actually stabilize the weapon's movement and flight as it heads toward its target. There's a lot of danger involved down here because if we don't do our job right, something very bad could happen to the ship and the crew. crew has no more demanding and dangerous duty than transporting the world's most advanced bombs to the flight deck. They're going to pull the weapons off the uh, elevator car and they're going to perform a weapons inspection on them now. These weapons are inspected through every step of the process, from the magazines to the hangar bay and again on the flight deck. He's going to check all the electrical connectors and pins to ensure that we're going to have a positive electrical connection. This is a satellite guided weapon, so he's checking the antenna now. Okay, we're moving the weapons to the bomb farm now. It's a two-person rule for safety whenever you're moving a skid of weapons. This weapon weighs about 1,000 pounds. The final step in this exacting process is securing the bombs to the aircraft. Ah, good. Bring it forward, bring it forward, bring it forward. Once I'm locked up and ready to go, Let's go right there. Let's go right there. check my whole pylon, make sure my pylon's still on the jet, make sure all my pins are up, make sure all my pins are flush. I got the pin back here that's in there, gotta make sure it's good and on. This cable that he's gonna put on right now makes the aircraft to the GPS system in the bomb. Make sure the bomb knows where it's going. Right before the bomb comes off, it feeds all the systems to it. The pride that comes with wearing the uniform never seems to change. Every day I'm up here, it's always a good experience to come up here and know that uh, I'm doing something to protect my country and help my shipmates out whenever I can. It's not only one jet that I'm loading. I got other jets around this jet. If something happens, if something can go wrong, somebody, somebody can die, and I, I can't have that. The weapons of war, however, are ever-changing. This ordnance team has just loaded a bomb that can see through clouds and strike within yards of its target. A bomb that 40 years ago was the stuff of science fiction. Until the 1960s, all aerial bombs were gravity-driven. They simply hit wherever gravity and wind currents carried them. They were rarely accurate, killed indiscriminately, and required multiple strikes to achieve success. But the modern battlefield is dominated by smaller, more accurate, smart bombs, designed to surgically eliminate military targets. We don't have to drop something down that'll take out an entire city block because we don't know which part of the block it's going to land in. Now we can put it in a certain building. So now we get to the point where we can put it in the third story window of a certain building. The Iraq Wars of 1991 and 2003 demonstrated how bombs have evolved into precise, sophisticated weapons. During Operation Desert Storm, the U.S. used 7,400 tons of guided munitions. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, more than 10,000 tons. Unlike missiles, smart bombs cannot propel themselves. But the advanced hardware they pack enables them to guide a path with stunning accuracy. Smart bombs rely on smart 
people. A laser-guided bomb depends on either a second aircraft or a soldier on the ground, getting close enough to the target to mark it with a laser. Since the beam reveals the position of those transmitting it, the laser is aimed at the last possible moment. The bomb, already in flight, then zeroes in on the mark. You release the bomb before you put the spot on the target. You put the spot on the ground or over on a wall or over a tree, and then you move it because it takes a finite amount of time for that weapon to get to the tank. And the tanks sometimes turn around and shoot the laser operator, and you don't like that. Another type of smart bomb, a TV-guided weapon, is steered remotely by a bombardier operating video game-like controls. A TV-guided weapon, when you saw it, as it got closer to the target, the target got bigger and bigger and bigger until it flashed out because you're seeing the camera moving closer and closer to the target. Although 1990s-era smart bombs struck with great precision, they relied on visual identification of targets. Cloud cover or smoke from fires could obscure targets and force the cancellation of bombing missions. In 1991, immediately after Desert Storm, engineers began seeking a solution. They knew the U.S. needed an all-weather smart bomb. It needed JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munitions. Uh, JDAM has been used in combat in Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and something on the order of 15,000 JDAMs have been dropped in combat. JDAM converts conventional gravity-driven bombs into smart ones. A tail kit containing a global positioning system and inertial navigation system monitors is attached to existing 500, 1,000, or 2,000-pound freefall bombs. This is a JDAM guidance kit. Right now it's attached to a 2,000-pound Mark 84 warhead. And just about this section here is the heart or brains of the navigation and guidance function. I brought along a unit here. This is the mission computer. On this side is an inertial measurement unit that has the sensors from the INS and in the middle is a GPS receiver card. GDAM's navigation monitors send signals to movable tail fins that maintain the bomb's flight path. It consistently strikes within three meters of its target and operates under all atmospheric conditions. The JDAM weapon is useful in all weather. So clouds, smoke, doesn't make any difference. You've launched it from an altitude, you've told it where to go, it will go to that point on the Earth. JDAM was originally designed to take out fixed high-value targets, but its astonishing accuracy made it a powerful tool against mobile targets deployed near American troops. In Afghanistan, some new things happened. Special Forces troops were put on the ground. They were provided with equipment that would allow them to actually get coordinates of targets, and they were able to call in JDAMs on targets that they were actually seeing there that were uh, stationary, but maybe had moved very recently. This is a, a close air support role rather than what was originally thought of as a high-value target attack mode. In years to come, JDAM will be supplemented by an even smaller and smarter bomb. Small diameter bomb is the next step in uh, the evolution of uh, miniaturizing weapons. Small diameter bomb is a 250 pound weapon, but with about 35 pounds of explosives in it. It has diamond back wing that gives it the ability to fly. This is a small diameter bomb mock-up. It's about six feet long, about 250 pounds. This is the configuration that it would be in when it's stowed on the aircraft so that it's sleek and aerodynamic. The wings are folded in, the tails are folded in. Once it's launched and dropped off the airplane, the wings will extend, open up like this. The tails will be popping out also. From there on, it will glide itself for 40 or 40 plus miles until it impacts the target. Small diameter bombs enable planes to carry more weapons and pilots to fly fewer sorties. Smaller bombs also create opportunities to strike multiple targets during a single mission. Now 
that will take up a B-1 with 96 small diameter bombs in it and hit 96 different targets and hit them precisely and with very, very minimal collateral damage. Another type of bomb known as the sensor-fused weapon, or SFW, unleashes many warheads towards multiple targets. Once the SFW is released from the aircraft, gas bags that resemble car airbags inflate and push out 10 separate submunitions. Parachutes then deploy from each submunition, slowing their fall and bringing them into a vertical descent over the target area. At a predetermined height, the parachutes eject and rocket motors fire, stopping the descent. Once the rockets burn out, each submunition releases four warheads that scan a target area of about 30 acres. Once the explosive is detonated, that projectile fired at hyper velocities into the target and it penetrates the armor plating. Uh, once through that armor plating, it starts to destroy the individual components below that armor. SFWs are the smartest of the smart, able to track moving targets and distinguish between jeeps and tanks. Each of the 40 warheads has a laser sensor that searches for changes in height, such as the distinctive contour of a vehicle. At the same time, infrared sensors seek heat signatures like those emitted by the hot engine of a target vehicle. SFWs played a critical role in Operation Iraqi Freedom. We had uh, lighter armored uh, Marine forces making their initial push into Baghdad, starting to come into the lead elements of the Iraqi Guard uh, that were positioning themselves to ambush and uh, potentially uh, attack the U.S. forces uh, entering that area. We called in SFW strikes, and the uh, passes of those weapons absolutely decimated the Iraqi Guard troops before they were able to effectively employ against the Marine units. During the height of Operation Iraqi Freedom, SFWs were used 68 times to devastate enemy forces. Sensor-fused weapons are at the cutting edge of so-called data link munitions, bombs able to identify targets and adjust to attack the highest value kill. Tuned image seekers and complex computer algorithms will soon increase the level of information and may eventually be able to distinguish between hostile and friendly targets. While the first Gulf War accelerated the development of smaller bombs, it also led to the creation of the largest non nuclear device ever made, the mother of all bombs. marked a milestone in military history. At Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, the United States tested a new superweapon. MOAB, short for Massive Ordnance Airburst, quickly became known as the mother of all bombs. This massive weapon creates a blast radius stretching a mile in each direction. The MOAB is made out of an aluminum skin, a very thin aluminum skin. And the reason we did it that way was in order to maximize the blast effect. We did not want the airframe of the bomb to interfere with the development of the blast wave that has the impact to the target. The world's largest non-nuclear weapon, MOAB is over 30 feet long and weighs more than 21,000 pounds. It's no easy task to accurately maneuver such a behemoth through the skies toward its target. Engineers overcame the challenge with a grid fit design that provides great aerodynamic lift. Uh, during carriage, these four grid fins are folded forward onto the bomb in order that it makes a very compact uh, design for carriage. When the weapon is deployed, out the back end of the C-130, the fins are subsequently deployed 
with aerodynamic assisting in the deployment because the wind is coming from the forward of the bomb. Uh, once it's in its flight configuration, as it is shown here, it is then able to control the bomb and fly it to its designated target. Although Moab was fast-tracked for Operation Iraqi Freedom, the lack of enemy resistance kept it grounded. But its successful test run served chilling notice of a powerful new force. The largest guided bomb in the history of the world with the tremendous impact and detonation of this explosive really just shook the area. And the shockwave could be heard for miles and miles. The deadly potential of bombs such as MOAP is the result of hundreds of years of evolving technology.